Good morning, Glenn Kirk. How are y'all this morning? Looks like the rain's holding off so far. Uh, well, we're here. I'm here. I'm filling in for Eric. Eric's at um, elementary school camp. I think he's probably on his way back right now, but he, was, he spent the weekend uh, with some kids, so he asked me to fill in, and so we're going to lead uh, us in worship this morning. So please stand, and we're going to sing some songs together. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come, we're gathered together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grace. In the name, in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come. We're gathered together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grace. Hear the joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down, as your people sing.
self-existent beyond the end before beginning eternal one creator god you made the world and it was good all in all self-sufficient but never distant made for your love fashioned from dust it gave us breath and it was good Blessing and power, but because your name alone is worthy, worthy forever, the praise is yours. We hid our face, separated, betrayed your heart. Our glory faded when our own way gave but you would not for you are good she sent your son for our forgiveness to ran to us you kept your promise light of the sing this song again. We sang it a couple months ago, and it's actually a really old song, but uh, I have a lot of fun with it. So uh, this is the chorus. This is what we're going to sing for the chorus. So repeat after me like this. Is a rock, a solid rock, a rock we built our lives upon. There is a hope, a blessed hope. So we need a rock. There is a rock. A solid rock, a rock we built our lives upon. There is a hope, a blessed hope, so we now shout. Here we go.
Salvation comes from only you, our shelter and strength through all ages past. Your awesome power has been seen. The nations are searching for something that's absolutely true. So we now declare that Jesus, all truth is found. and welcome. Uh, go ahead and turn and say hello to um, each other as you greet each other. And kids up through fifth grade are dismissed to their uh, children's church. Well, welcome. For those of you who braved the storms to come here today, we're glad that you're here worshiping with us today, whether you're here in person or worshiping out on the chilly patio or worshiping from the comfort of home through our live stream. Um, encourage you to check out the bulletin for everything that we have going on. And uh, I, I would ask everybody to tear off that connection card from the bulletin that you got and fill that out. And we are especially um, excited to hear from you if you're new to Glenkirk um, or if you have prayer needs that we can stand with you in prayer. And so encourage you to do that, to fill that out. And then in a little bit, the offering plates are going to come by and I would invite everyone to drop their connection card in the offering plate as it comes by. Uh, a couple of announcements that we have for um, uh, for this week. Uh, tonight, we are hosting a men's night of worship here at Glenkirk and encourage you, if you're a guy, to come out and worship with us. Um, this is the third one of these that we've done as we've experiencing increasing unity and connectiveness with the other churches in our area. We're going to be hearing from Pastor Dave Anderson from Church of the Open Door. I'll be leading us in communion. We'll have a, uh, a worship team from different congregations. So we'll start at 5 p.m. in the event center with dinner, and then we'll move over here about 6.15 for worship. I invite you if you're a guy to come out. Also, um, the season of Lent is fast approaching. It begins on Ash Wednesday, February 14th, which is also Valentine's Day. Nothing says romance like sackcloth, ashes, and repentance. 
Um, and so um, if you would like to receive the imposition of ashes, we'll be doing it in the morning with ashes to go in our roundabout. You can just drive up between 7.30 a.m. and 9 a.m. Um, in our parking lot, roll down your window, and one of our pastors will be available to um, um, impose ashes and also to pray with you. And then we'll be having an Ash Wednesday service um, at 7 p.m. that evening and invite you to come and to worship God um, as we enter the season of Lent. We're also in Lent launching Lent discipleship groups that start February 18th. Um, we have signups out on the patio for different days and times. We also have them online and uh, invite you to sign up for a five-week Lent discipleship group. Um, and then uh, finally, um, last weekend, 30 of our middle schoolers went up to Forest Home for winter camp. Um, and right now, we have 36 elementary age and high school students at winter camp in Forest Home. And I'll uh, be praying for them that as they come home this afternoon. And then last week, 11 of us from Glenkirk were in South Carolina at our Network of Churches annual gathering. And so we're thankful for just just the various ways God has been working. And now I want to invite Olivia Martin up to do our final announcement. Give it up for Olivia. Good morning, Glenn Kirk. I'm excited to be given the opportunity to announce something very amazing coming up. This summer, our students will be going on a mission trip to the Bahamas. This will be an amazing trip where we'll all grow our faith by teaching other people about the Lord. There is a catch, though. The trip is very expensive, so we need your help. We are throwing the Nacho Ordinary Fundraiser. You can pre-order a kit after both services today. Each kit is $40, and it comes with beef, cheese, salsa, and sour cream. You also could order a football rice krispie treat for $15 a dozen. Pickup will be on Sunday, February 11th, after both services. On behalf of all our students, we'd like to thank you for your donations. And now would you join me, join me in prayer as I think our students are going to be uh, going to their programming. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you as we gather today on this day to worship you. We thank you for the great experience our middle schoolers had at winter camp last weekend and the experience our elementary age kids and high schoolers are having even now. Uh, we pray for safety for their travel home. Um, and we ask as these storms come in over the next few days that you would keep us safe as well. We pray for our world that you would bring peace where there's war, clarity where there's confusion, truth where there's falsehood, love where there's hatred and indifference, and justice where there's oppression. We pray for Glenn Kirk that you would use our leaders to help us love you more obediently, worship you, and grow as disciples. We pray for Pastor Kate as she shares the message today. We pray for those who are new to our church, that you would help us welcome them with hospitality and that they find a place to belong. We lift up our night of worship tonight, Lord, that you would continue breaking down walls and creating unity among the churches in this community, and that together we might stand in your light as salt and light to our world. And now, Father, we join with your people all over the world and in every language in praying the prayer that you gave us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now is the time in our service when we worship God through our giving as we offer our tithes and offerings. And as the ushers come forward to receive this morning's offering, I would invite everyone to drop their connection card with their prayer requests in that offering plate. Let's worship God through our giving today.
Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the saith the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood, just in simple faith to plunge me beneath the cleansing, cleansing flood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust. How I approved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. I'm so Precious Jesus, Savior, friend, and I know that Thou art willing, will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how. Trust him more, oh, for grace to trust him Good morning. My friend Josh Fitzpatrick once told the story of taking his 17-month-old daughter to the beach for the first time. He said he and his wife Megan were so excited to show her the ocean. And so they got to the beach and they set up their chair and the chairs and umbrellas and their, uh, their towels. And they went to put their daughter on the sand. And a funny thing happened is that the, they went to set her down and her legs just went right up into the air. And the closer they tried to put her to the sand, the higher her legs would go. She was not having any of it. So he said that after uh, quite a bit of trying, they finally just gave up and set her on the towel under the umbrella. And my friend Josh went and got a bucket of water from the ocean and brought it to her. And she started playing in it. And then she really loved this bucket of ocean water, so much so that she would stand in it. And when she did so, she'd just get this big smile on her face I, I asked Josh to send me a picture of his daughter at the beach, and so here it is. 
<laughs> There's little Emily, 17 months old, so excited about this bucket of ocean water, completely unaware that an entire ocean of water is a few yards away. She's feeling so much joy just in the smallest bucket, oblivious to the immeasurable joy she would experience if she simply looked up. We're in the fifth week of our series, Jesus Revelation, where we're looking at the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, and we are seeing the various ways that the curtain is pulled back to reveal who Jesus is. Part of our mission at Glenkirk is to be a worshiping community. And our prayer is that Jesus Revelation would, would help us to see Jesus's glory with more clarity so that we can be an even more passionate worshiping community together. The first week we looked at Jesus as the son of man. We learned that Jesus is not someone we can control or contain or co-opt for our own message, but that, but that we worship Jesus in awe and in intimacy with him as our prophet, our priest, and our king. The second week we looked at Jesus as the worthy lamb who alone is worthy of carrying out God's plan of salvation for the world. The third week, we saw Jesus as the infant chased by the dragon, which I'm very glad I didn't choose the short straw on that one. Um, good job, Tim. <laughs> but that one taught us that Jesus is a participant in this unseen spiritual warfare in heaven and earth, the child who at the cross defeated a dragon. And last week, we read about Jesus as the groom at the wedding feast, for we as God's people are looking forward to that day, the wedding between Jesus and the church, when all things are made new, the greatest love story of all time. And today we're looking at the next image of Jesus found in the book of Revelation, Jesus as the temple of God. So if you are able, would you please stand for the reading of God's word from Revelation 21, 22 through 27 and chapter 22, one through five. Hear the word of the Lord. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it for the glory of God gives it light and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut for there will be no night. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as, as, clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great city, street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun for the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So how are we to understand what's going on here? Where does this vision of John's and Revelation fit in the story of God and God's people? In the first two chapters of Genesis, if you'll remember, the first book of the Bible, we encounter this symphony of creation as God creates everything that exists by speaking it into existence, every animal and bird and sea creature. And the pinnacle of God's creation is humanity that is made in the very image of God. And all of creation was declared to be very good. And this good creation, however, was marred by the entrance of sin and evil and death in Genesis chapter three. Harmony between humans and God and between humans and one another is disrupted and the consequences ripple through scripture. And even then, there's this hint of a redemptive plan, a promise that the offspring of the woman would crush evil underfoot. Throughout scripture, 
Both the Old and the New Testaments, God promised over and over and over again to make all things new. This plan of redemption for the world has been unfolding, and here in our passage this morning, John's eighth vision in Revelation, John sees what it might look like when God makes good on God's promise and all things are made new. Just before our passage this morning, John sees a new heaven and a new earth. He says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. God was seated on the throne and said, look, I am making everything new. So our passage this morning is found in this context of this new heaven and new earth that John sees revealed. There's a new heaven and new earth, heaven descending down upon the earth and the relationship of heaven and earth seems to be one that is close and intimate, much more so than heaven and earth now. And in this new heaven and new earth, John sees Jerusalem, the holy city, And he notices something strange about Jerusalem. It's kind of a city and garden and country all mashed together. And there are things missing. He says there was no temple for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. He says there's no sun or moon for the glory of God gives it its light. And Jesus the Lamb is the lamp. John sees this garden with a river flowing and and the tree of life healing the nations and God with God's people. This is a hopeful vision. This is what it could look like when God is faithful and God makes his promises known. It is a prophecy that sin and brokenness will one day be eradicated and that God's original intention for creation will one day be fully realized. I read a great quote about prophecy a few weeks ago in a children's book. I was reading to my uh, four-year-old Jonathan, and because our kids' names are Jonathan and Miriam, we tend to have a lot of kids' books about Jonathan and Miriam in the Bible so they can get to know the stories. But this book was about Miriam because she's a prophet, and there was this great line in there that said, prophecy is a cloudy glass, a muddy river, a curtain pulled a bit aside. What I've appreciated about this series in Revelation is that Pastor Tim has acknowledged that Revelation is a prophecy. It's a vision. It's the curtain pulled a bit aside, not a clear view, but a cloudy one, not something totally spelled out. But some in the Christian faith have looked to Revelation and have used it to claim that things are incredibly clear, even down to the day and time that Jesus will return. And that's simply just not what Revelation is meant to communicate. And that's not our goal here. And that's why I love that quote, because it reminds us what prophecy is and that we need to have theological humility when we come before it. So I've appreciated what Pastor Tim has done. You're gonna see a little bit of passion from me. And it's not because I think I know everything about it. I wanna come to this with theological humility as well. Okay, great. (laughs) So what might this vision of John's teach us about who Jesus is and what Jesus will do? I wanna look at a few pieces of this vision. First, the image, the first image I wanna dive into is the temple. John says, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. As Pastor Tim has taught us already in this series, this vision of Jesus as the Lamb of God is the most prominent image of Jesus in the book of Revelation. He's described over and over again as the Lamb bearing the wounds of having been slaughtered for sacrifice. And in the gospel stories, that's exactly what happens. Jesus is the Lamb sacrificed on the cross for the sins of the world. But here in Revelation 21, Jesus the Lamb is also described as the temple. And throughout Jewish history, the temple has represented God's presence with God's people. While the people of God wandered in the desert, God dwelled with the people in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle, the kind of tent, movable tent thing that they had as they wandered in the desert. 
And then when they could make a permanent building, God dwelled in the Holy of Holies in the permanent building of the temple. In the New Testament, we see God with God's people in the fact that Jesus came in human form as God, Emmanuel, God with us. And then when Jesus ascends to heaven, the Holy Spirit comes down on the people of God. And the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians that the people of God all together are the temple of God the presence of God with us, that God lives within me and you and us together. So what might it mean then that the temple is Jesus? Well, one more thing about the temple. The temple was also the center of Jewish religious life. It's where so many different things happened, where babies happened, where babies were dedicated and people came to worship and pray, where priests did their work and where the Torah was read and taught. But perhaps most importantly, the temple was where sacrifices were made to atone for sins and make people right with God. So Jesus, as the temple in the new Jerusalem, in this vision, what might this mean? In the gospel of John, Jesus is described as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In the words of the New Testament scholar Craig Coaster, Jesus functioned as the temple because in him atonement was made and the divine presence was revealed. In other words, Jesus is the temple in the new heaven and the new earth because Jesus fulfills the most important functions of the temple. In the new heaven and new earth, why would we need to sacrifice at the temple when Jesus has already sacrificed and made us right with God? Why would we need to come and hear the word of God preached when we are in the presence of Jesus, the living word? What possible purpose could a temple, the house of God, serve in this this new heaven and this new earth where we have unfettered access to God. In the book, he describes himself as the temple. He says, destroy this temple and I will rebuild it in three days. And that's exactly what happened. He was crucified, died and buried. And three days later, he rose from the dead. His body is the temple. How is Jesus revealed in this vision? There is no temple for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Jesus is a temple where we are made right with God, where we are in the presence of God, the living word. But the second image I want to jump into is this idea of the light. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, says John, for the glory of God gives it light and the Lamb is its lamp. How strange that this vision of a new heaven and a new earth has no sun or moon. I was thinking, what could this possibly mean? What functions do the sun and the moon serve for us? You know, the sun is the main source of light and heat for the world, helping all of life on earth. The sun provides much of what plants need to make their own food. It regulates hormones. It's central to life. And the light from the sun keeps the darkness at bay, illuminating everything during the daytime. Pan sets the tides and for the Jewish people sets the seasons and the calendar. So we see things like the source of life and timekeeping and illuminating all things. In this vision, there's no sun or moon to do those things because we have Jesus. Jesus fulfills all those things for us, illuminating all things. The glory of God gives the city light and the lamb is its lamp. Furthermore, in this vision, there is no night. Did you notice that? For Jesus's light is forever shining, never giving way to darkness. And that sounds an awful lot like the way Jesus is described in the gospel of John, when it says that Jesus is the true light coming into the world. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness does not overcome it. Or in 1 John, which says that God is light and in God there is no darkness at all. There's no night in this new heaven and new earth and the city gates are never closed. Biblical scholar Craig Keener says that the gates of ancient cities were closed at night to protect the city from invasion while everyone was sleeping. But here, the gates are always open. 
There's no night and there's no fear that anything bad will be brought into the city. In fact, the only thing that says is being brought into the city is the glory and honor of the nations. There are no gates to be closed. There is no night and people will always have access to God, never being barred and the light of Jesus will be shining without break. Surely we see glimpses of this kind of light of God in our lives here. Kind of like the sun shining through the blinds in our homes. We see these little glimpses when people love us, when people forgive us. But this vision show will cease to exist and only light will remain. God's light will cover the earth and everyone will know God. Revelation 21 articulates this hope that one day the light of Jesus will cover the earth and darkness will be no more. The temple, Jesus as the light. And these two ideas together bring this third idea I wanna highlight, which is Jesus as the center. The temple was the center of Jewish religious life. The sun is the center of the solar system around which everything revolves. The moon was the center of the calendar, the seasons for the Jewish people. There is no temple, no sun, no moon, no centers except that of God. They are the center of everything around which everything else in this vision, this new heaven and new earth revolve. Even the kings of the earth who a few chapters before were at war with God are now bringing the glory and honor of the nation to this recognized center, Jesus. This passage from Revelation 21 and 22 teaches us about Jesus as the temple, the light, the center. And what does it teach us about what Jesus will do? I love that John describes one more piece about what he sees as a garden. He sees this garden, a vision of the renewed heaven and renewed earth coming down and God dwelling with God's people. And in the midst of everything, this garden with a river of life out of it and the tree of life healing the nations. It's a beautiful vision, but it, it also harkens us back to a different garden, doesn't it? In the beginning, God created the world and God was with God's people in a garden. And there was a tree and a river and fruit. There are some differences here though. In the garden in Genesis grew the tree of life, but also the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The tree that man and woman took fruit from and ate and ruined everything. But in Revelation, only the tree of life is mentioned. In Genesis, the entrance of sin brought with it the curse of death. But John says when he sees the garden, there's no curse to be found in Revelation. In Revelation, we see this garden of Eden renewed, restored, recreated. And just as in the new Jerusalem, there are a few things missing. There are a few important things missing in this garden as well. As George Eldon Ladd points out in his commentary on Revelation, the final chapters of the Bible echo the first chapters, creation, a garden, a tree of life, God's with God's people. In the beginning, God created a world that was good and in the end, God will renew and restore everything that exists. Creation and recreation. What an image. New heaven, new earth, God with God's people. But I have to ask at this point, is this what you envision when you think of life after death? Is this what comes to your mind? As you hear the words of the apostle John in Revelation, this new heaven and new earth and holy city with Jesus as the temple, the center, is that what you picture when you think of life after death? I often hear believers talking about their hope of heaven, but I seldom hear anyone speak about this. When I hear believers talk about life after death, it's usually like, you know, it's okay. I'm gonna go to heaven, it'll be fine. They speak of heaven like it's an escape or a vacation. And I get it because amidst the turmoil of this world, rest sounds really good. 
And while it's true that God's people will go to heaven and be with God after death, we see this in John 13 of Jesus preparing a place for us. We see this in Luke 23 with Jesus telling the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. We see it in 1 Thessalonians 4 that those who have died with God, those who have died are brought to God with Jesus. While that is true, theologians like N.T. Wright point out that that is not all there is. There is a deeper truth about our ultimate home in this life after this life. Life after heaven, when all things are made new and it is bigger than simply saying, I'm gonna go to heaven. When my dad died three years ago as the resident family pastor, I found myself writing his eulogy and I did not want to write, it's okay, he's in heaven. Not because it's not true, but because that's not the epitome of my hope. That is not where my hope lies. Don't get me wrong, I take great comfort in knowing that my dad is with Jesus and that he is loved, that nothing can separate us from the love of God. But my hope is that after heaven will come a day with a new heaven and a new earth when all things are renewed and we are in this new world with Jesus as the center. That is my hope. John's visions here in Revelation 21 and 22, they sure look like full life. We see the nations, we see God's people working, serving God, This doesn't seem like how N.T. Wright says, this is not a disembodied perfection. This is full life with other people, with God in the city garden. And it's beautiful with Jesus at the center. Is this what you think of when you think of life after death? Because I think as Christians, we have settled for this small vision of what life after death might be, like my friend Josh's 17-month-old daughter standing in a tiny bucket of ocean water. And maybe we've missed what has been here in Revelation all along, that there's a whole vastness to life after death. We're so satisfied with this tiny little bucket. We have no idea the joy that's gonna come after this life. In 2016, a TV show came out that sparked a lot of conversation about what life will be like after death. It was called The Good Place. And it's a show that imagined this whole thing. The basic premise is that Eleanor Shellstrop, the main character, played by Kristen Bell, is a horrible person on earth, extremely selfish, always taking advantage of other people, no moral ethical line at all. And she dies and wakes up in the good place, in heaven. And she quickly realizes that that was fully by mistake. But there was a technical error that put her in the good place instead of the bad place. And the show is about the lengths she would go to to keep anyone from finding out that she's in the wrong place. And while some in the church weren't too happy about a comedy poking fun at this idea of the afterlife, and I get that, I thought it was a great view into the psyche of America. What does the average non-Christian person think happens after we die? And, you know, in this good place, everyone has this perfect home and a perfect spouse there's everything they could ever want, just, you know, at the drop of a hat. They, they, have, they can ride unicorns and they can fly in the air. And two things stood out to me about this show. One is that God is completely absent from it. Here's an entire show about the afterlife, about what happens after we die, and God and Jesus never show up. In fact, the way that you get to the good place is by living moral lives on earth and you get morality points. And if you get enough, you get into the good place. But the second thing that surprised me about the show that stood out was the utter lack of hope in it. The writers of the show seem to ultimately believe that a heaven where you can have all the fun you want and the perfect dream home and the perfect spouse and all of that was ultimately boring. 
that eventually it would lose its luster and perhaps it would be better just to die than to have that be what happens after death. And I'm sorry for the spoiler, but the show is eight years old. <laughs> In the end, that's what Eleanor Shellstrop chooses, death. I've had more conversations about life after death because of that show than I ever had before. And it opened up a lot of conversations even with fellow believers about it. And I have to say, when I talk to other believers, the majority of them, their view of life after death doesn't look that much different than what it looked like in the good place. Perfect home, perfect spouse, all the fun you want, all the food you want. They just have a little bit of Jesus mixed in. But here's the problem with that. The goal was never heaven. Heaven is not the goal of the Christian life. The Christian life is not about a disembodied, perfect, good place. The goal isn't an eternal vacation. The goal is life with Jesus. That is the goal. And that is something that you can have, not just after death, but here and now. And yes, scripture says that we will be in this perfect rest in heaven waiting, that's waiting for us when we die. But after that, this vision John has of the new heaven and new earth, that looks a whole lot like life. It makes me believe Jesus when he says, I came to bring them life and life abundantly. And I have to say, our goal is not heaven. Our goal is life with Jesus at the center. Because perhaps the writers of The Good Place were right about one thing. Life after death, no matter how perfect or fun, is utterly meaningless without Jesus at the center. And I'm not saying I know everything about what life after death will be like. I really love that line from that children's book. Prophecy is just a peek around the curtain. But this vision of John gives me hope that what we think of now is merely a bucket. And there is a vast life waiting for us after death. Because God is faithful and God will make good on God's promises. Heaven and earth will one day be made new and we will have life. A world restored, renewed, with Jesus at the center, the temple, the light. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Gracious God, we are so grateful. You are so gracious to us. Thank you for your promise of life here and now and life. God, may we never settle for a small vision of what we might think is waiting for us, but know that you have so much more in store that our hope is so much greater than we ever thought. Jesus, be the center then and now to us, we pray. In your name we pray, amen. All the things that seem so big now look so small The selfish dreams I held so high I let them fall, fall. Now that I have tasted And I've seen who you are I let go now I give you my all In the light of your glory in the light of your beauty and grace from above I consider all things of this earth only lost In the light of your glory and love So many are the fears that were controlling me so many voices calling me away from me Oh, just give me your presence 
and your grace from the cross, it's to you I cling. Lord, I give you my all in the light of your glory and love. In the light of your beauty and grace from above, I consider all things of this earth only lost in the light. I give my love, I give my life to you forever. No one compares to you, my precious Lord, my Savior. I give my love, I give my life to you forever. No one compares to you, my precious Lord, my Savior. I give my love, I give my life to you forever. No one compares to you, my precious Lord, my Savior. I give my love, I give my life to you forever. No one compares to you, my precious Lord. Consider all things of this earth only lost in the light of your glory and love. Oh, I consider all things of this earth only lost in the light of your glory and love. We come to this table to remember what Jesus has done for us on the cross with his body broken and his blood shed. But we also come to this table in expectant hope of that wedding feast at the end of all things when everything is made new. And this is just a little taste of what that will be like. So as we prepare our hearts to come to the table of Jesus, let us pray this prayer of confession together out loud. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved our heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Now hear these words of assurance taken from the book of 1 John. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So on the basis of God's word, we are forgiven. Thanks Amen. be to God. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread and after giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. And as often as you do, do so in remembrance of me. And that same night after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them. And he said, take and drink. This is my blood of the new covenant shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. Let's pray together. Father, we come today hungry for your grace. We come to this table today thirsty for all things to be made new. We come weary with the pain and the sin and the brokenness and the injustices of our world. And yet we come in hope that a great banquet will come one day. 
And until that day comes, we come to this table to receive this bread and this cup as a foretaste to nourish and sustain us in our journey. We ask that you would send your Holy Spirit upon us, that as we eat and drink in faith, that this bread and this cup would be a sign and a seal of your forgiveness and of our hope that one day all things will be made new. God, we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. When the music begins, I want to invite everyone to come down the center aisle, and we'll have four stations here up front to receive the bread and the cup. We have these self-contained packets with both uh, a piece of bread on the top layer and then juice on the bottom layer. And so you could go to any of the four stations and receive this and then go back to your seat along the side aisles. And then I would invite you to open it and to take the bread and to drink from the cup in your timing as you feel led. If you're up in the balcony or if you're out on the patio, we'll have servers that will come and bring them to you there as well. And if you're unable or would prefer to not come forward, just raise your hand and we'll have servers that will bring um, the, the elements to you as well. We also have gluten-free bread. Just let any of the servers know that you would prefer gluten-free bread and we have that available. Let's commune with each other and commune with the Lord Jesus together. Amen. Thank you. 
thank you for worshiping with us today. If you are carrying a burden and you would like prayer, we're gonna have a team of elders and deacons and lay pastors up here to the left after the service, and they would love to pray with you. You don't need to carry that alone. I'd also like to remind all the men to come on back this evening for a night of worship. Looks like it's gonna be a great time of community with fellow believers in our community. But now, please stand and hear this benediction as a blessing on your week. This week, may you experience the powerful love of Jesus. May your life continue to be altered to center around him alone. And in your struggles this week, may your hope be found not in the idea of a disembodied, perfect place of eternal vacation, but may your hope be found in life abundant with Jesus as the temple and center. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.
Cause you 